This is an oral history interview conducted for the Witness to War Serving a Nation Project at Nassau Regional High School on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. For the sake of this interview, please state your full name and community in which you now reside. My name is David DiTascio, and I live in North Truro. Thank you. Okay, so how did you end up on Cape Cod? Okay, um... I was born in Brockton, and my folks had a summer home in Wellfleet on Pine Point Road. So I spent all of my summers in Wellfleet up and through high school. So then you later moved here after your time serving the war? Excuse me? You later moved here? Uh, after I graduated from high school, I went into the service did my time, came back, went to college, dropped out, went to the Virgin Islands, came back, finished my degree at Massasoit. I received an associate's degree in liberal arts and then I transferred to Bridgewater and received a degree in sociology. Wow, that's awesome. So, uh, what college did you go to? Excuse me? What college did you first go to? See, I'm really bad at his hearing. What college did you first go to? First college I went to was Massasoit. Okay. It was on the, the Duxbury campus. There were two campuses, one in West Bridgewater and one in Duxbury. I went to the Duxbury campus. And what made you drop out of college? Um... I had a hard time dealing with a lot of things that were going on. Uh, I really had a hard time adjusting again to civilian life. And it, it just got to be too much for me and I just decided I needed to do something else. So I had an opportunity to move to the Virgin Islands. So I, I moved there and uh, spent a little over a year there and then came back and moved over to Martha's Vineyard for a while and then got back into school and got my degrees. Can you tell us about the islands? How is it different from Keytown? It's warm all the time. That's nice. Yeah. Um, I got a chance to um, participate in a racing against uh, the team that was going to the Olympics in 72 in Kiel, Germany. So that's basically what I did for a while, just get up in the morning, go out and race and come back and drink a lot of Heinekens and <laughs> over and over and over again. Sounds nice. Yeah. So uh, when you uh, were deciding to go to Vietnam, were you drafted or did you enlist? Okay. When I was in high school, joined the National Guard and after I graduated I went to my the unit that I was in in Brockton was the 26th Yankee Division and they were an artillery unit so when I got out of basic training I thought I was going to go to Fort Sill Oklahoma where they trained artillery and at that point I was told know what your unit really needs is an additional medic and I was I was just floored there's no way that I was, that I was going to be a medic you know and but um, orders were orders so uh, I went to medical training at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio Texas I spent uh, a little over four months there and then came back and I was in my unit in Brockton. And I wasn't going anywhere in Brockton. You know, I just, um, we'd have like a drill every Tuesday night. And then once a month, we'd go for a weekend. Uh, there was an army base at the uh, Otis Air Force Base in Falmouth. We would go there and uh, they'd fire off their howitzers. And I'd be just sleeping in the 
medic van in case something happened. You know, and then at nighttime, you know, just party, 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 and then drive back to Brockton on Sunday and start it all over again. How old were you when you were sent to Texas? Um, 18. Wow. So right out of high school? Right out of high school. How is it like transitioning from high school to Texas? I started growing up a bit. Um, the medical training was pretty intense. You know, and, and I knew the seriousness of it all. But I still didn't want to be a medic. <laughs> so, um, came back. I was in the National Guard for, oh, about a year, all told. And I just said, I can't, I can't do this for six years. So I'll enlist in the regular army and have a three-year commitment. So I did that, and I immediately got sent to Fort Knox, Kentucky, um, to a medical unit another one of these mass units uh, and I was with them for about a year and the army decided to disband that unit what? so they didn't have any use for it there so all the people that were in the unit got to write down two places they'd rather get transferred to wow. and my first choice was the Boston Army base. So I could just deal with all these guys coming into the Army, physicals. I figured that'd be pretty cool. And my second choice was Germany. Just about everyone got their choice, except for me and a half a dozen other guys. We all got sent to Vietnam. Wow. So you said in Vietnam you served in Dao Tiang? Dao Tiang. Dao Tiang. What yeah. was it like there? Well, it was 45 miles um, northwest of Saigon. And there was a Vietnamese village close. The original camp that we were in was a uh, rubber plantation that was owned by the French. And then the Vietnamese kicked the French out. Um, it was just there. so. Vietnam War started, uh, U.S. troops came in and took over that, that plantation. That was our, our base. So, was um, how was Dao Chang different from Brockton? Like, was it beautiful there? Pretty, like, not so nice? I, I wouldn't call it beautiful, no. The plantation itself was a very nice place, mm -hmm. but uh, you're living in a jungle. Brockton didn't have any, any jungles. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. So, uh, what did you, how did you feel being sent to Germany? Like, what were your feelings about it? Oh, I was, I was just going to go and float. You know, I was going to go spend my three years in Germany and get my discharge. Were you, like, nervous about it at all? Or were you just like, you know, it'll be okay? When I got, when I got my orders for Vietnam? Yes. I knew I was stood a chance of not coming back. Mm. That was one of the main concerns. But I was trained as a medic, and they said that they needed medics there, and I went. Wow. So what was the training like? Like, what did you learn during it? Oh, um, so many things. Uh, in training, you would be the medic one day, and the next day you'd be the patient. And they would say, you know, uh, your patient has a sucking chest wound. How are you going to treat it in the field? Or, you know, very severe injuries. You know, and how is it? And, and, and they would go through step by step for this type of wound. This is what you do for this injury. This is what you you have to stabilize the the patient. 
and uh, get them out of there as fast as you could. So you had to memorize all of these steps for all of these different potential mm -hmm. scenarios? Mm -hmm. Wow, that must have been stressful, right? <laughs> it was It was stressful, but when I got to Vietnam, um, the doctors that were in my base camp were incredible doctors. There was one doctor who worked with this doctor, uh, oh, what was his name? Michael DeVacy, something like that. He was a, a, one of the first heart surgeons that did a heart transplant. And this doctor that was in our base camp worked with DeVacy. And I can't tell you how many lives this doctor saved with his, with his skills. And, and when we were working with patients, if, I, if you ever had a question, they were there, you know, and, and say, well, you know, and if, if the patient died, well, next time, why don't you try this, you know? And, and they told you right away, you're gonna see a lot of death. You know, and, and that, that got to me. I'm sure, I mean, seeing all those people in such bad condition must have been pretty... You know, shocking. here I am in 2021, 20, and I'm seeing guys 18, 19 years old, you know? I, I'd been in Vietnam for maybe like a little over a year, and... and uh, we had the Tet Offensive. It was in uh, January of 68, I think. And that was a, the, the North Vietnamese and, and the Viet Cong. That was their biggest drive against us in all, all of Vietnam. It was this giant war. It was the, the, their Lunar New Year. And, and we lost a lot of people during that time. Did you lose any friends you made during the war? Yeah. yeah. Did you, you, are you still connected with any friends from the war? The doctor that I told you that we, we reunited after 50 years. Yeah, that's um, great. But once again, once I got back, I just wanted to leave everything behind. I just didn't want to deal with it anymore. And, uh, uh, you know, I joined the Veterans Against the War. You know, I mean, just the amount of people who died there was mind blowing. You know, and 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 to this day, uh, I have problems with that. A lot of veterans do suffer with like PTSD. I do. How does that affect your day-to-day -day life? Well, you should ask my wife about that one. <laughs> um, when I got back, uh, I had a hard time adjusting. But when I came to Provincetown, I got involved with the fire department. I was one of the volunteer firefighters. I got uh, involved with the underwater rescue squad. What's that? We were a dive team, and we would if someone went overboard, and we'd go down and find that person. Uh, when some of the boats uh, were sank, we went down and, and investigated. There was a uh, a boat. That went, uh, that sank off of Wellfleet. And uh, myself and another diver, Donald Thomas, he used to be a police officer in Provincetown. He was the dancing cop on Commercial Street before <laughs> you guys were born. Uh, you, you, you folks will know. Um, Donald and I dove on this boat because they thought it was a Provincetown boat. It was painted as a Provincetown boat, it had the name and everything on it. But we dove down on it, and Donald came, Donald and I came up, and Donald said, That's not the Divine Creator. I used to fish on a Divine Creator. So we went back down, and we 
cut the line that was over the fish hatch and all these bills of marijuana started popping up. Wow. So did your experience in the war help you with being a fireman or being on that team? Yep. How so? I knew what my job was on the fire department, on the underwater rescue. You know, and it felt that I was paying back some of the things that all of these people that lost their lives never got to do. One of my biggest problems was um, I served with guys that were, you know, married, had families, uh, had graduated from college, had all these fantastic things that they were going to do with their families after they got back. And they never got back. And I was a person who didn't have, I only had a high school education. My parents didn't have any money to put me through school. Uh, and so I, uh, I lose my mind sometimes. Uh, um, so yeah, that's close. Speaking of family, who did you tell about you like uh, going to Texas or Kentucky and then going to Germany later? Who's the first person you told about it? Some of my friends I was staying out with. And, you know, my folks knew where I was my folks knew where I was going. I uh, I had I had three brothers when passed away. He uh, he served his three years in Germany. I had another brother who was two years older than me and he was in an artillery unit in Vietnam. And as I was going to Vietnam, he was just getting out of Vietnam. So it would have been nice if we had, could have connected somewhere, but that was not to be. Did your brothers uh, going into Vietnam influence your decision to go too? Well, as I say, you know, I graduated from high school, no money for college, jobs weren't great. So I figured it was a way out of Brockton and hopefully come back mm -hmm. and get to do the things I wanted to do. So when you were growing up in Brockton, did you ever think, oh, well, after high school, I want to go to Vietnam? No. Never? Even when I was in high school, I didn't want to go to Vietnam. <laughs> but you thought it was like the only way out of yeah. Brockton? So looking back, do you regret going to Vietnam? No. Why not? So I, I did two tours. I volunteered to go back. Really? I was still there. Why? This is a good one. I had, after my tour of Vietnam, I still had a couple years to serve. And I was trained to do a job in Vietnam. And I honestly could not see going back to the States, being on a military post, and who am I seeing for patients? I'm seeing recruits that are just coming in. Uh, I see dependents, you know, uh, their husbands who were over in Vietnam and they were getting medical, they lived on base and they were getting medical treatment. Um, I didn't want to do that. I, I was trained to do a job and I had time to stay there. So I stayed. So you decided to stay despite it being very shocking and trouble. At that point, at that point, you know, um, I knew that I just couldn't go home. I knew that, as I say, I was trained to do a job and my job was there to help save lives. That isn't what I'd be doing back in the States. Uh, mm -hmm. Just couldn't do it. So. When you were in Dao Chiang, what were the type of friends you made? Did you have like a special connection with them that people back home didn't have? Oh yeah, it was a it was a life and death situation in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I had you know friends back home who 
got drunk and drove their cars into a bridge or, you know, stuff, you know, and were killed, you know. And that was really a waste of life. Yeah. So going to Vietnam, you really saw, like, how much people could do with their life, how much potential they had. Yes. And so when you were a medic, you said you were a dentist, like, mostly. I was, I was a medic but for this pacification program going into villages. This doctor dentist trained me in extractions. So when I wasn't going into a village, once it was secured, in a regular base camp in Dao Tiang, when the wounded were being flown in helicopters, I was there, we're getting off the helicopters. The people that could fit into the immediate facility, they did a, a triage where they would take the patients off the helicopters outside of the medical unit and the doctors would decide who had the best chance of surviving. So those people would go first. And the other people who really weren't going to survive their wounds were medicated. So they weren't left alone. We stayed there with them. And hopefully, by the time the less severe that that were going to survive got shipped out to Kuchi and then whoever else was left they worked on. What kind of injuries did you see for these people who were qualified to escape? People torn apart. Um, there was one Easter, Easter Sunday when uh, he had a, a mortar attack at the base camp. And they brought this young guy in and his leg was gone. Uh, his arm, one of his legs was gone, his arm was gone. And he looks up at me and he says, what day is this? I said, it's Easter Sunday. It's my birthday, I'm 19 years old. He died. Oh my God. That totally, totally blew my mind. To this day, you know, and, and sights and sounds. Um, when these guys came in, of back choppers. There was this smell of the perspiration of their urine, perspiration, and blood. I can close my eyes and I can still smell that smell. So, did you see that every single day, like those types of injuries? Every day. There were, I was saying, there were very few days that we didn't have casualties. And I mean very few days. And, and uh, I was getting ready to come home after my second tour. And I was, in, I had like two weeks left in country. And my uh, two weeks left in the country. And normally, when you've got that much time left, they'd fly you down to Kuchi, where you'd get a little relaxation. It was a giant, giant camp, medical facility. And uh, I kept on waiting for my replacement. It wasn't coming. I kept on waiting for my replacement. It was. And then um, the North Vietnamese. And the big contractor overrun our base camp. Who are those? 
Who were those? The Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese soldiers. They tried to they tried to attack our base camp. They, we, we didn't have a, an airfield. We had a helicopter landing area, and um, their main goal was to get in, blow up the helicopters, and go right through. And that night, a lot of us thought we were going to die because we were on the front lines fighting. And, and when the sun came up that morning, you couldn't believe how many people were laying dead in front of us. And I said, to God, I said this is half, two weeks left in Vietnam. I honestly thought I was going to die that night. Did you have any people that you were like were staying with and like talking about your fears about that night? Did you have friends that you were talking to about that night? We were, <laughs> we were, the unit that I was with. Um, we were all experiencing the same thing, and we were just. We all knew what we were all going through. And we needed that support from each other to keep us going every day. You know, see, so we're a really tight unit. I'm sure. I mean, going through that type of things with people must have brought you so close together really quickly. So, did you go back to when you left Vietnam, did your friends, did some of them at least leave with you? Actually, when I left, I was the only person in my unit that had discharge time. And this is my second tour. And uh, a lot of my friends left before me. And friends that I had, you know, I left and they were still behind. So when you left, did you ever go visit your old friends, wherever they moved to? When, when I left, I kept in contact writing to a few. And then as time went by and things were happening, I just lost contact with everyone, say, except for this doctor who, yeah. after 50 years, looked me up. So he was the doctor that mainly taught you about all your training? For he, he was the he was the doctor who trained me in dentistry. You know, the other doctors, quite a few, um, really, they wanted you to be able to do it right. And, and you know, I mean, they were losing patients too. So, you know, mm -hmm. they say, you know, I'm a doctor, and, and, you know, we can't save everyone, you know, but we can do the very best we can and to ease their pain. So you did have patients die on you? Oh yeah. Yeah. What was it like uh, experiencing that? Once again, we all had each other for support units. You know? My buddy Nyhuizen might have lost someone that day. You know, three weeks later, I might have lost someone. You know, we, we were all going through the same thing. So we, we had a, I say, a, a good support system going there. And, and the doctors were incredible. You know, I've never, never once did a doctor say, you fucked up, and that reason that guy died is because you fucked up. You know? Sometimes we did fuck up. You know, intentionally. Mm -hmm. They said, okay, next time, this is what you should do. So you learned immensely from your past oh, mistakes. Yeah. What were the living conditions like in Dao Tiang? We lived in tents. And we had a bunker. Sandbags. And... a bunker in the middle and a tent on each side and when the mortars started coming you'd get out of your cot and go into the bunker just slide in 
to your bunker. And then they were, they were, when the water started coming in, there'd be an alarm system going off. You know, bam, 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 and go in. And then when it was all clear, there'd be another signal, different tones. And uh, What is mortar, exactly? Mortar is a round that goes into a tube, detonates, goes up in the air, and comes down. And boom. Uh, during the Tet Offensive, um, it was the first time we experienced getting uh, shelled by 122 millimeter rockets. And at that time, this is during the Tet Offensive, uh, it was the first time we were attacked with these. And at first, if a, more, if, if a 122 meter rocket hit one of the bunkers, it was so powerful it would go into the bunker and explode. Wow. So we had to reinforce all the bunkers. And, and, you, could, and you could hear it coming in. And you just get on the ground and just claw yourself onto the ground because the sound and it's getting closer and it's getting closer and it's like, oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, scary sound. I'm sure. Did it like shake the whole bunker? Oh, well, I was never in a bunker that got hit. Oh. Okay. But just hearing them come in. Did you have any good memories from the war? Like really great memories that you can still think of from today? The friendships. You know, I was never that close to anyone as the guys that I served with. We, we were all watching each other's back. That's really nice. And the doctor you met with 50 years later what was it like seeing him again? I'm still trying to factor all of that. It was great. It was fantastic seeing this guy. Um, funny guy. He, he was the doctor that sort of like kept us all up there. You know, no matter what kind of shit that went, went on. He was always there. It was always had a joke. Always, always got us, you know, we'd be like down, you know, we might have been working on patients for 30 something hours. We'd be dead on our feet and he would come in and just start cracking us up. We, one time, uh, we were under a mortar attack. Now, officers and enlisted men really didn't associate with each other. But this guy, we were under mortar attack one time, and he slides into our bunker with a fifth of Jack Daniels. And he says, guys, I think we're going to be here for a while, so let's pass this bottle around. Wow. So yeah. it's really important to have someone like that oh, yeah. with you during those times. Yeah. And so seeing him 50 years later, what did you talk about? Did you talk about your time in the war? Yeah, we did. We did. And, and all the things that happened after yeah, you know all the all the things that he did, all the things that that I did. Um, I, when I came to Provincetown, all my life, I can't tell you how much. One time, I I tried to write down all the different jobs that I had throughout my lifetime. And I was pretty amazed, you know, even just coming to Provincetown, um, you know. Fire department, underwater rescue, recovery. Um, I worked on a whale watch boat, got my captain's papers, and and, and did that. Uh, and then marine superintendent, province town. After I retired from there, I became a summer police officer in province town for several years. You know, and and once again, it was working trying to do something good. One time, when I was in the police department one time, um, there was a car accident on, on Route 6 down by Champaign Road. And 
I was the first on the scene. Rescue was right behind me, but I was the first on the scene. I got out and I knew the person. Oh, wow. Okay. And he was having problems like rescue comes and they say, we're going to have to cut these pants. And the guy, you're not going to cut the, you're not going to cut my pants. I said, you better shut up right now. <laughs> These guys are trying to help you out. Uh, but, um, yeah. So, after coming back from the war, what was the first thing you did? Okay, I came back and spent a few days with uh, my folks. And then I got in the car and came down to Wellfleet and spent a couple weeks in Wellfleet. I'd get up in the morning, uh, I'd go to the package store and get a case of beer. I'd go to the beach, and all day just sit there and drink beer. Didn't want to be around anybody. A couple of kids that I, well, kids, uh, these are all adults now, that I knew from growing up in Wellfleet. Um, once again, they, they all had families, you know, and, and I just want to be left alone. Did you see your family a lot after you got back from the war? <sighs> For a while, yeah. When I, you know, when I after after I got out, um, I I moved back in with my mother and father uh, for a couple of months, and then I decided I you know I had to be alone. And drugs, yeah, I did a lot of drugs. Uh, I came down to Provincetown, I did a lot of, I started doing a lot of cocaine. Uh, one night, I was with some friends, and they had this, like, ball of cocaine, and we started doing it. Doing it. And by 2 o'clock the next morning, I thought my heart was going to explode. Well, I said, if, if I survive this one, I'm never going to do cocaine again. And I've never done cocaine again. Wow. Pot, I was a big pothead. Real big pothead. But then you, when did you meet Annie? I met Annie. Um, I was married. And uh, we moved to Provincetown just for the summer. And by the end of the summer, my wife wanted to stay. So we stayed. Uh, I started, I said, I worked so many jobs. I, I started the first bottled water company in Provincetown. It was called H2O2Go. Wow. And it was uh, from Simpson Spring Water. And I was doing that for a while. And then two guys came knocking on my door and said, you know, you got something to get a going here. We want to buy your business. Well, I was getting kind of tired of taking those five-gallon jugs of water. Sure. You know? and, so, and so I sold the business. And then um, shortly after that, uh, my wife filed for divorce, moved, took the kids. And, uh, she was, my wife was married before. She was my high school sweetheart. Okay. Uh, her parents told me, my daughter's going to go to college. She's going to be successful. It's time for you guys to part ways. So I, when, I got, when I got back, um, I bumped into her. And she was going through her divorce. And that's when I went to the Bridget Islands. I came back, reconnected, and uh, married. I adopted the two, two little girls. And um, let's say we got to Provincetown, um, so she decided that uh, she wanted a divorce. So she and her boyfriend uh, moved to Vermont with the kids and put the kids in a private school. And now you live here in Peach in this amazing house, might I add, and really great location, and you paint cars. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. So, you know, so, uh, so I met Annie when I was diving for lobsters. Annie owned, with her two partners, the Inuit Duck Creek Sweet Seasons 
I think it's called The Well now. In oh, Wellfleet. in Wellfleet, yes, yeah. I know where that is. Yeah, so she and her two partners own the whole property. And Annie would come to uh, me and the guys that I drove with uh, to pick out our lobsters. So that's how I first met Annie. And then uh, when I had the water business, I uh, approached her to see if she wanted to buy any of my products. But as you saw, my, my license from the Virgin Islands, that's how I looked. And she didn't appreciate that look. So um, years later, I cleaned myself up a little bit. And uh, I worked for a trucking company that delivered liquor on the Cape. Reggie's Trucking Company out of out of Provincetown, and the business got, got some of their liquor from uh, the supplier. So I would stop in and, and see Annie and say, "Hi, how you doing?" And everything. So one time I went in and uh, she had a waitress who was real cute, and I decided to go in and ask the waitress if she wanted to go sailing. Well, Annie said, oh, Jeannie's not here, but I have tomorrow off. I'll go sailing with you. Ooh. That's how it all began. That's so sweet. And so now living with Annie all these years, do you ever talk to her about your time in the war? <sighs> Annie went through some rough times with me as far as that. You know, dreams and, and, and she was great, though. You know, she said, sometimes they know you. I think you need to see someone professionally and, 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 and go over these things that are really bothering you. you know, and I did. And the only bad thing about that was medication. You know, well, you have to take this antidepressant, you have to do that. And I was just tired of doing all that stuff for such a long time. And then came medical marijuana. And I was able to cut back on my meds and feel a lot better. So I, I am a, a big supporter of medical marijuana. Big supporter. And that really helps you with dealing with it? A lot. No, it's, and, and, and I do like, uh, mainly do like um, edibles, infusions, uh, cookies, uh, capsules. No, I'm not big on, I've never smoked in my life cigarettes. Mm -hmm. you know, so. Well. I think that's all the questions we have. Thank you so much for your time. This has been really interesting. Do you have anything to add? Excuse me? Do you have anything to add? You two have been wonderful. Thank you. And I have a surprise for both of you. Ooh. After this is over. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.